everybody to day two of Earth Week. So yesterday was kind of a kickoff and I, I gave kind of a overview of where we're going with the week. Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, we are, uh, I invited a group of uh, panelists each day, three people each day, um, addressing various kind of themes throughout the week. So uh, Wednesday, we're gonna look at kind of social, political dynamics of food systems, more on the policy side. Uh, Thursday, we're going to go into kind of some, the future of food, where we think things are going. Um, but all those themes we can kind of talk about at any time and blend together. Uh, but today, we have uh, three great guests with us today. We're going to be talking about just agriculture today, kind of specifically in Marshall County and the surrounding areas. Yesterday, you know, we took a very global, national, really big picture, kind of about agricultural production. And uh, being that so few of us now live uh, within agricultural households and are connected to the food system. Um, I thought it'd be really good to hear from producers, educators, and uh, people that are involved uh, just to the issues that Bob was just talking about, about the issues that um, uh, farmers are facing today. So um, with that in mind, uh, the format we, we wanted to go with was basically to give uh, each of these gentlemen kind of some introductory time to explain who they are, what they do, kind of how they got into the work and what kind of sustains what they do. And then I have a few kind of prepared questions, prepared questions for them and we'll save some time at the end uh, for some question and answers from you all. Um, so just uh, for introductions, uh, our first panelist is Sam Irwin. He's the owner operator of the Indiana Berry and Plant Company um, up in, your address is in La Paz there, is that correct? In Plymouth, Plymouth La Paz area. Many of you guys have been there or like me when you bought a house went straight to there and ordered as many different kinds of berries as you can to get them in the ground. Um, or thank you. For, or the pick and patch, yes. And then our, uh, our second guest is uh, Bob Yoder from Purdue Extension. So he is the, uh, let me see if I get the title officially right, Agricultural Natural Resources Extension Educator. So he's in his jam right now. This is what, this is what uh, we have as a land institutions per university to educate from uh, the public, uh, to disseminate kind of the information at the academic level and from the producers um, to, to make that connection. So we're thankful for him coming out today. And our very own Professor Tim McLaughlin, the director and the founder of our uh, agricultural department right here at Ancilla. So with that, um, the, the mic should be live there, gentlemen. And we only put two, so you'd have to fight over them. But uh, please be cordial. I'm going to hang on to this one, and if you guys can have those. so. Oh, there we go. Okay. Maybe a little less vicious this way. Um, all right. So, Sam, if you'd like to go ahead and, and well, I grew kind of up introduce. With my mother telling me to always use my inside voice. So, I don't like using microphones, but I guess I can if you have trouble hearing me. Okay. I'll use it. My mother would be very surprised that I, you want me to use this. Now, you want us to uh, tell about who we are and where we came from and where, what we. Yes. I grew up south of Bourbon on a traditional Indiana corn and cattle farm. I, my dad got me started planting when I was about 14 years old, got me planting some blueberries and strawberries, and I just kind of stuck with that and grew through a, bachelor, a bachelor's degree out of Purdue and then a master's in horticulture out of Ohio State. I came back thinking I was going to be a farmer and grow fruits and vegetables, and I got out in 1979 and immediately went into the agricultural crisis, where everything was crashing around us. Those of you older remember, everything crashed around us. I was able to survive as a farmer because I was raising fruits and vegetables, and we had the cash flow to... Uh, uh, stay in business, but we, we couldn't get any loans, no banks would talk to us, so I started for more cash, got into selling, uh, well now we say picks and shovels. You know, if you think about the miners that went out west and followed any gold rush, the, the prospectors made very little money, but the people that sold them picks and shovels made some money. So I kind of got in the picks and shovels business, supplying things to people who raise fruits and vegetables. Um, in, some of you know Pick and Patch, which was the farm I started, and one time I had three farms. I had a farm in Fort Wayne, one at New Green, and the one at north of Plymouth. I now only have the, the one local. Uh, so my whole plan of how I was going to do this changed drastically in the 80s. Um, I have since have numerous businesses that are all related to fruits, vegetables, and nursery. Um, I'm going to tell you that I import and distribute and manufacture machinery, and mostly sprayers. No, okay. <laughs> I'm going to get into that when I give my talk about sprayers because it says here about what are the common misconceptions of the food system, and I'm going to spend some time on that with you guys because I think it's important. Um, uh, so I've been uh, uh, the main businesses now, and I brought the literature, the machinery business, 
Um, and I brought some different things I'll talk about. We have a sign business. You see these banners up and down the road that say, uh, you pick sweet corn, or I mean, not you pick fresh sweet corn, or you pick strawberries. Uh, we sell those all over. And then I have Indiana Berry and Plant Company, and there's some catalogs sitting on the table out there. If anything piques your interest and you want to take a look at it, or if you have any questions, I have the literature out there. Um, and uh, I guess that's the introduction you wanted to first. Okay, go and get your own. I'd have to share. Go and have to share. <clears throat> Bob Yoder. I grew up in Elkhart County, Napanee, Indiana, not too far from here. Uh, my dad had an agriculture business, ducks, and a small farm. Uh, I did help out on that. Uh, went to Purdue University, got an undergraduate degree in uh, animal science, managed the Purdue sheep unit for a couple of years, had 450 ewes. So there'd be nights I'd just stay there all night, lambing away uh, during the lambing season and, and not go home and see my family. Went back to my dad's farm thinking we could make a go of it there. Worked there for two years and decided that dad and I didn't communicate that great. So I went back to Purdue University and got a master's degree and became an extension educator. I worked 14 years in southern Indiana, uh, in Davies County, Washington, Indiana area. So there was an Amish community down there. Common theme of the last name Yoder for me. I was Mennonite at one point uh, in my family tree. Uh, and uh, moved to Marshall County in 2004. And, uh, and part of my job is to work with uh, production farmers, uh, helping them to maintain their accreditation for, uh, uh, to manage their uh, crops with uh, uh, pesticides to control pests, uh, uh, work with farmers on innovative ways to grow crops to sustain their, uh, their soil to maintain productivity. I work with homeowners, uh, teach a Master Gardener intern class, which I saw a couple of my class participants here today, uh, and, uh, and do various things in agriculture. I work with uh, vegetable producers on a smaller scale, because we don't have a lot of those in Marshall County. We have some old order Mennonites in the southern part of the county, and some Amish up around the Bremen area that are producing produce. Oh, forget. <laughs> Um, my name's Tim McLaughlin, and I've, uh, uh, my resume looks like a guy that can't keep a job, but uh, <laughs> now I, I started off in uh, Nashville, Illinois, which ironically is um, close to, well, my daughter was born at Centralia, Centralia, Illinois, at St. Mary's Hospital, and um, so before I took this position, one day I was on the second floor, and I was looking at that, some of those beautiful murals, and the one that has all the different locations. When I looked at the Southern Illinois area, all those names were familiar to me. Um, my wife taught at Carlisle, and, and uh, so it's, it's always been kind of interesting for me that, that uh, my path, I hope, ended here. Um, but uh, I'm one of the few ag teachers in the state of Indiana that did not go to Purdue. Um, I, uh, I've, I've got great friends at Purdue, and, and we work really well with them, but um, when I left high school, uh, uh, I, I don't know how to describe it, there's probably some of my teachers could explain it better than I could, but um, I, I, was, uh, I was interested in attending a junior college, and at that time in Indiana, uh, there were no agricultural junior colleges. So most of the Illinois junior colleges were full of Indiana kids. And uh, I made that trip to uh, Blackhawk Junior College in Kewanee, Illinois. So when the opportunity here presented itself, that's why it was, uh, I guess, a calling to me is to give kids in, in Indiana a reason to stay home and uh, learn more about the industry that they love. Uh, so I taught in Illinois for 10 years, um, uh, did my uh, bachelor's and graduate work at Southern Illinois University at Carbondale. Um, and then, let's see, I left Illinois after 10 years, um, I taught at Columbia City for four years, and uh, it's interesting, at Columbia City we had 472 kids in the ag program. At, uh, in Illinois, there weren't even, the school I was at there, there weren't even 472 kids in the whole school. I used to tease the driver's ed teacher, um, we literally had to go to another county to see a stoplight. So, uh, but um, so then uh, was at uh, 
Columbia City for four years, uh, was at LaVille for part of a year, and then ended up at John Glenn, and uh, that was the final stop in my high school career, uh, great school. Uh, work with all kinds of students, uh, that's the best part of my job. Um, these ag kids are, are special, and, and uh, I really enjoy working with them, especially since a couple of them are sitting in here. <laughs> All right, thank, thank you for those introductions. So we had, <clears throat> I had sent them kind of a couple questions ahead of time, so we'll kind of dive in some other stuff that I've been kind of thinking as they've been talking, and um, I think we'll just dive into those, and as you guys are uh, kind of hearing the responses and thinking as well, just keep those in mind, we'll pass the mic around. Um, one of the first ones, I wanted to uh, invite each of you to respond. What, what is some kind of, uh, being that you guys are so familiar with uh, food production systems, and a lot of us, <clears throat> even though we eat three times a day, you know, are not familiar with how a lot of these things are produced, manufactured, distributed, um, marketed, and the, the whole machinery kind of behind the curtain. That's kind of one of the things we talked about yesterday is all this stuff is happening and all we see is a hand come out of the curtain with a plate of food and we say thanks. Um, so what, what's kind of one misconception of that behind the curtain uh, in terms of uh, food systems and ecological yeah, communities. Yeah, we, we do have that up. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that. I talk about manufacturing sprayers and people think that, and especially they have this ad that runs from that Goshen health food store that we have the organic produce that has had no sprays or chemicals put on them. Organic products and crops are sprayed. They're sprayed with chemicals. They're sprayed with chemicals that are approved by the organic rules. They are sprayed. We build and sell lots of sprayers to organic farmers. They yeah, take, take a look at this spray right here just for fun, and we'll talk about it a little bit. Um, they are, uh, uh, we are thinking about actually designing a sprayer just for organic farms because the chemicals are very, very corrosive, they're abrasive, they tear up conventional equipment. And if we can build a stainless steel pump and put greater agitation in because they don't agitate very well, that we're actually thinking about building a sprayer just for organic growers. This is uh, a sprayer that is designed, we'll, we'll talk, I don't know how much time I'll have to talk about this sort of thing, but one of the things, this is European technology. Uh, this is the most expensive sprayer ever sold, and I did not build the tractor, but I built, basically putting some French booms on here to spray this. In Europe, you have to get 95% of your chemical into the target. Now, many of you have seen orchards sprayed here where these huge clouds are going out, and you know, it's blowing over into the, you know, blowing, blowing. This, and by the way, this is an organic blueberry farm here in Indiana, the largest organic blueberry farm in the eastern U.S. And you see that almost all the chemical is going directly. That's an organic chemical being sprayed on a certified organic blueberry farm. So when, when I hear those ads saying no chemicals are sprayed on our organic fruit, I feel that is a common misconception of what really goes on. Um, so uh, I guess that's my biggest one for that topic. <clears throat> Well, I'll, I'll delve into that a little bit. I concur that all crop production has pest management associated. There's many ways we do it. Uh, one way is using cover crops to minimize weed production uh, when we're not growing the actual crop. But we have insect pests. We have some unique insect pests that are really a problem for fruit production now. Uh, spotted wing of the dress is a is a is an insect that has a new way to insert eggs into fruit that looks like a knife on the back end of the female, and they put it into ripening fruit instead of rottening fruit. So that's really impacting the industry that uh, uh, Sam is so connected to. Uh, you know, it, it's uh, 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 one of those where we have to be timely in harvesting fruit and managing to see if the pest is present. So that's one of the challenges that all growers have. Organic, traditional is managing pests. And, and it's a very complicated process, and you have to think of systems on how to manage those pests when you're producing, whether it's a grain crop, a fruit crop, or it, with livestock, with myself, uh, I have my hobby sheep, and it's parasites. I gotta manage parasites in that production system some way, you know, and, and that's part of food production, is managing pests, because they're out there. Uh, and uh, if you have an ash tree, you know they're out there because your ash tree is probably not with us anymore. Adam, uh, could you repeat the question? 
What are, what are some common misconceptions of the food systems or the ecological communities you work with then? I, I watch uh, politicians all the time and they answer questions that weren't asked, so I thought I'd clarify. <laughs> um, you know, as a population, we are blessed with information. We are probably one of the, there, there's more information available to us about our food and, and as, a, as a population, especially in the United States, we're, we're, uh, we're bombarded with information. And, um, and that's, I'm of the belief that more information is always better than less. And so I think we are really, really blessed that that's the situation. One of the frustrating things for me though is uh, not all this information is good. Um, there is often, uh, you know, one of the things I tell the kids is, is when you're reading something, uh, especially on the internet, um, you know, we all have biases and things, but identify that and, and validate it, you know, make sure that this is information that's there to educate, not to uh, distract or, you know, persuade or scare, you know, I, I think. Um, so, and, and I brought an example. Um, I was teasing Adam about not having any water. I had to bring my own drink, but this is a prop. Um, I brought this. There are currently 10 genetically modified crops in the United States. It's alfalfa, apples, corn, canola, cotton, papaya, potatoes, soybean, squash, and sugar beets. Um, on the front of this orange juice bottle, which is delicious, by the way, uh, simply orange, I look at the uh, ingredients in the back, 100% orange juice, no sweeteners, no added sweeteners. Right here at the top, oh, I pulled it off. It really was there when I opened it. Oh, there it is. Uh, it says non-GMO. There are no GMO oranges. Okay? Technically, that's true. Okay? That is true. By the same guidelines, my shoes are probably, you know, non-GMO. Um, so, I, I think sometimes that, that information is put out, and these guys probably can talk even more about it, um, that uh, we, sometimes we have to sort through a lot of things. And, uh, but, but the thing that I'm happy about and, and what, I want, what I love for my students is that uh, not only are we blessed with information, we're blessed with choice. And people have the ability in the, um, to do what's right for them and their operations. And, uh, and I, I think that is something that uh, is really important as we go forward. I'd like to add one more thing to that. As far as a misconception, our food supply is incredibly, phenomenally safe. It is good. Uh, to give you an idea, I just draw, I used to sell to organizations that sold through Kroger's and all that. And by the time I quit, I had to have every field in my blueberry farm. It, just at that farm, that little farm you see, I had seven different fields. And any fruit that I ever sent through the system, it had to know when it was picked, who picked it, and what number field it came from so that if anything ever happened at Kroger's, they'd be able to go back to the date and the field from my little farm in La Paz, Indiana, where it came from. And I also think another great thing, and this is one of the soapboxes I get on, that not only is it safe, it has improved so much that we can sit here and complain and whine about the quality of it. We're so spoiled. I mean, when I was a kid, there were still places that were worried about having enough food. Now we only worry about who has the cheapest skim milk half gallons in paper, not plastic. You know, that's what we worry about. We don't worry about the supermarket having milk, which was different than, and especially my parents and grandparents during the depression. In my lifetime, we've seen so many things change. And that's one of them that I think is so awesome that we can sit here and, and just worry about the quality rather than it, it being there. Um, so our food is safe. It's incredibly safe, safest in the world, I think. So I just I need to make one comment with what he shared. Did you hear what he say? Cheapest. Yes. Uh, my mantra is, we'll grow it how you want us to grow it, but pay us so we can make a, a living that's sustainable financially. Mm -hmm. Our dairy farmers right now selling commodity milk are going bankrupt. We're losing dairy farmers in Marshall County as we speak. 
because the commodity they sell, it, we're not paying enough for it. And so if we want to have a more sustainable agriculture uh, where we're renewing our soil and not using, using as, as many of uh, some of the pest control options, it's more costly to produce and these people need to re meet, receive the income so that they can have a nice house, a nice car, be able to afford to send their children to college as well. Can I get on one more soapbox and I promise I'll stay on topic, okay? <laughs> Because he brings this up. In my lifetime, once again, we've seen, when I was a kid, the movers and shakers in this country were Depression era and World War II eras. They saw shortages. They saw starvation amongst people, affluent countries and affluent areas. They saw the starvation in Europe. They saw all this. So for ag policy, because you mentioned ag policy and making money, we had an oversupply policy. So you keep, they could not let supply and demand come into play because they wanted to have an oversupply. We must have an oversupply so people will not be hungry. So they had to put in the farm programs. Well, the movers and shakers of today can't even begin to think of a food shortage. Like again, once they said all they worry about is who has the, the, the skim milk and the half gallon paper. Um, and this is gonna change. I know tomorrow's your big policy day, but I think that he's right. You gotta make money at it. We want oversupply, you wanna make money. We wanna have the healthier stuff. But it's, it's going to be a whole different policy going forward than we've had over the last 50 years. And the agriculture of today has evolved from those policies. So when, when, when the new policies start making, I think of that young uh, congressman from New York. I, I, I think that she probably has no concept of what has happened in the food. And I, nor do I think she ever worries not about being able to buy something at the grocery store. But it is possible. It's very possible there could be shortages again. So, okay, that's my last soapbox. I promise I'll stick to that. No, that, that was very good. And that kind of... Uh, brings up 10 different directions we could go. But I wondered if you could also comment on, you know, the food system is not just, you know, the input, output, this, that. You know, there's all these other things going on at the policy level, like you mentioned, that are incentivizing people to do things in various ways, and uh, which may profit uh, some members of the system and drive out of business other members of the system. So you mentioned the dairy farmers. Now, what you know, an another thing that we didn't even have time to get into yesterday is the consolidation of a lot of these supply chains and food systems uh, into, you know, a, a, a few number of uh, the major pork producers, beef industry, that sort of thing. Uh, my understanding is that, was it Walmart came into, they have a processing plant in Fort Wayne. Um, you know, my understanding is they want to control that supply chain in terms of economic kind of dominance from the retail from the beginning to the end. Um, it, you know, is that an accurate portrayal? Is that overall beneficial? Is that going to be, you know, if you're their one star super, super supplier, are you going to be benefiting in what's happening to these other uh, producers? Let, let me take a crack at that. Um, the, the whole dairy situation, and it's going to take longer than we have to explain that mess, but um, when we were just talking about uh, the food security, um, understand for Walmart or any retailer, it is to their benefit to buy milk from the fewest amount of farmers possible. And, and so what we've, what we've developed is it, it's driven us to the point where in the old days, every farm had some dairy cows because it was cash flow, okay? And that milk check is probably what bought groceries that week and all those things. Um, so every, the milk truck went and picked up Bob's milk, picked up my milk, picked up the neighbor's milk, and then took the milk all to a location. Well today, uh, and part of it is the safety deal, is that the regulations have gotten so tight, that model buying, because that milk all went in the same truck. And if I screwed up my milk, I ruined Bob's milk and all the neighbors' milk. And you couldn't send a truck to each farm. So we've, we've, and when I say created, I don't mean, it's just, part of it, I guess, was probably on purpose, and part of it was just the nature of the beast. And we've ended up with a situation where, you know, when I walk into Walmart, Walmart milk was, and I bought gallons and gallons of milk for bottle goats. So. I know the price of milk in Plymouth, Indiana. Um, it was a dollar sixty-seven, and Dean's milk right above it was over three dollars a gallon. Um, 
Now, when you're a family, I, we're blessed in the United States that we only spend 10% of our income on our food, um, on average. Uh, and, you know, I, I always like to give this example with the kids. That allows us, you know, I, I've had them add up the value of the clothes they were wearing that particular day. I would like to have the check that for their shoes especially, but I mean, when you talk about jeans and all these other things, you know, that's what allows, the, the fact that we spend so little on food is what allows us to do these other things that, that add to our quality of life. Um, so it, it's a difficult model to try to figure all that out and understand how we continue um, to offer opportunities for, for folks interested in agriculture in the systems that have been built and created, if that makes any sense at all. The, uh, our rules and regulations have exported entire industries in fruits and vegetables. I don't think you can find an, a plant uh, processing asparagus. I know there's no major plants left in here. There are no major brands. All the, all the asparagus has been exported to Peru because of labor laws and other issues that we deal with. You just can't do it here economically. And there's other industries that have been totally totally exported from the United States because of laws and regulations. And I think we're going to continue to see more of that. The strawberry industry is being pushed out of California with, uh, with, water, with uh, water and other uh, labor especially, with the labor going up so high they can't. They're working on robotic pickers, but uh, it's easier to move industry to Mexico. Well, that's interesting because they actually now have ro robotic systems that can process a live animal into cuts. From start to finish, you know, so it's, it's amazing where that technology has gone. But my point was, this is not the dairy industry. Size and scale is how agriculture has been driven to mean economic sustainable. So it's corn, soybean production, uh, you know, even tobacco production, which I know we aren't going to be supporting that here, but, or I, do I? But even that industry, which used to be, everyone used to have a couple acres in the southern part of our state to make their farm sustainable, that's gone the same direction, and I'm not sure why I picked tobacco, but that one, <laughs> no, that one's I, I, happened to it too. I will tell you one industry that has been uh, good for us, that's been growing in, in the United States, and that's the pot industry. Yeah, um, right, right. Uh, now, the people we're selling to are actually raising the fiber, they're doing it in fields for fiber, not the smoke uh, people, you know, they do it in small greenhouses and such. But the, 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 for fiber, uh, we sold quite a few sprayers into that industry out in California, especially, or Colorado, where they're growing it for fiber. And that's trying to be an industry here that I think is a good industry. They're trying to build it here in India. It is the fiber industry, so keep that in mind. It's not the drug industry, it's the fiber industry. My uh, grandfather, during World War II, grew uh, hundreds of acres of, of uh, hemp. Yeah, hemp. So, and it's coming back in this, in this state. It's allowed now. So. Probably one of the best examples of, uh, Bob brought up tobacco. Tobacco has always been one of the most highly subsidized, subsidized uh, crops grown in the United States. Um, if you had 25 acres of tobacco, that was pretty large. Um, and in the wisdom of, of the all things government, um, we pay tobacco farmers to grow tobacco and then spend millions on advertising campaigns to tell people not to use the product. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's why some Once of this again, stuff gets so complicated. The policies are to control it. The reason you do this is you, the government wants to totally control it. And, and when I was first involved in horticulture, you could make a living on three, two or three acres of tobacco. You go back to the 60s and 70s, just two or three acres you could make a living on. So, I got um, a question back here. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you Yeah, for the rest who, who didn't hear Elsa mention that, yeah, there's also downstream a cost. So that kind of gets into another thing. There, there's medical expenses at uh, end of life or throughout life through the, the consequences of eating, uh, from using tobacco, as well as anything else that we take in excess of any of the wonderful products that we like. We eat too much. Um, you can look into uh, you know kidney dialysis, tre treatment of diabetes, and uh, heart disease, and a variety of other things. Um, Chinese used to promote smoking. You worked harder and you died younger, you know. You were more active, hyper, <laughs> and you died younger. That's right. And they promoted it as a as a policy. So I talk about government policy and doing things. So an, another another thing I wanted to get into maybe before we open up the question and answering, we are we already 
uh, checked off hemp, so I can mark that off my list here, um, <clears throat> is uh, especially with uh, Sam being in uh, kind of more of the fruit crop industry, talk to me about the way you think or, or your, uh, the people you supply to uh, think about pollinators on the landscape, of the services they provide, how you manage for them, what, what role do they play in your system? I, I can give you all the, I mean, I see the same stuff on TV you say of how we're losing all our pollinators and how this is bad. I have absolutely no, tr I rent bees every year and I have absolutely no trouble getting my bees. I have more suppliers that want to pollinate than I need or that, and I have not seen any, I, I, I can't, I hate to sit here and say, but I, my personal experience is totally uh, opposite of what we hear on the press. And I haven't seen any decrease in that. Matter of fact, in the last few years, I've seen a great increase in bumblebees, which are a great natural pollinator. I think one of the things that's helped us locally a lot is um, I am not organic, um, but I, I've learned so much from the organic growers I know. When I started in business, we sprayed by the calendar. It was insurance. Oh, just put that on its insurance, just in case you might get that problem. Well, nobody does that anymore. And to take this even further, uh, we used to spray fungicides to protect the fruit. And virtually all the good growers I know no longer do that. They'll spray a fungicide to protect the plant. But the fruit fungicides used to put on, they just never, never did that much good, not compared to pruning and other cultural practices. You can do a much better job of controlling fruit fungus on, on, on fruits and vegetables with other practices than chemicals. We've all done, nobody sprays by the calendar anymore that I know of. I don't know of anybody who does it by the calendar anymore. You wait, see the problem, and then you take care of it. Um, did I answer your question at all? I got off on something. No, no, no. That, that was a really um, good point and something I was going to bring up earlier. A lot of, I went to a uh, fruit grower symposium uh, with Sam out at uh, Valparaiso and, and uh, Bob, you were there possibly. Or a lot of, Purdue, there's so many Purdue people there. I just put your face there. Um, and, and what they're doing is, like you said, it's not a, a mindless calendar year thing that w we thought was cheap insurance. Well, as your margins tighten, you can't even afford mobilize people and uh, put out uh, you know, money for spray. When the studies show it, you really, they have kind of what they call, correct me if I'm wrong, an economic threshold above which the population of that, just because you see a pest the first time doesn't mean that, oh my goodness, I have to go out and spray all these 30 acres. It's a systematic counting that they found. If they reach this one threshold, then it makes sense uh, to spray because there's also getting in the role of, ben you know, we've, there are uh, serious economic pests, but there are um, also beneficial insects and you have to maintain the, the predator species of those pests in order to have that bound. An example of that, I, I assume most of you have raised or see strawberries in the garden, and they really get, people get really hyper about leaf spot on strawberries. I've never, ever once seen leaf spot reach an economic threshold, and I always see leaf spot. But it's something, hey, don't worry about it. It's not that big a deal, but they, everybody wants their plants to look absolutely perfect, and they don't, they don't have to be perfect. If that's an example of what you're talking about. Leaf spot, I've never seen it to be an economical problem. And regarding with the pollinators, too, there's a guy out of uh, Michigan State. Um, oh, I'm gonna, just blanking on his name now. He's uh, part-time at Michigan State, part-time at uh, Michigan State Extension. for Mich uh, And he works with the blueberry growers in his big research uh, subject right Rusek now. Rusek Ivis? Yes, thank Isaac, you. Isaac Rufus. Uh, Isaac Rufus, Rufus yeah. yes. And he's, he's spoken at Cardno up the road, too, to talk about pollinators. And his whole kind of research question right now is the use of beneficial insects, not only the managed honeybees as well as now managed bumblebee species, but creating, it, every farm has kind of that two to five percent of the margins of the scruffy place so that where you got some old equipment where you, you know, don't mow, that you can create a, a diversity of uh, flowering native plants from the early spring to late fall because a lot of these, uh, you know, like blueberries, for example, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, you know, the, the, the more they get pollinated, it's not just a one and done on or off pollination. The more visits they have from pollinators, the bigger that blueberry gets, the bigger the yield is. And um, there are certain species that do very well with those pollinators. So he's trying to work with uh, producers um, at scale for those uh, fruit and nut crops to figure out where they can, because not only do you have to have flowers available for them throughout the whole year, but you have to have habitat. So most of these are ground nesting, so you have to have area that's left undisturbed, untilled, so that those can persist from year to year. One of the interesting things about pollinators and what you're talking about, bumblebees, you can actually buy bumblebees that are taken out of sequence, and they raise them in, basically in farms. They, you buy the bumblebees, they're good, they don't stay, you gotta rebuy them every year, they just die because they're out of sync, they manipulated their lifestyle, 
and they actually last longer than fruiting season. And I have one of the few people around here that has bought secondhand bees out of North Carolina because they do last longer than the blueberry season. So I was able to buy secondhand bees out of North Carolina, bring them up here, and get uh, more life from them. Now, whether or not something like this is, is right or wrong, because we're totally manipulating uh, bumblebees to, to provide what we need. So uh, again, these are things that are happening with pollinators. Whether it's right or wrong, it's, uh, it's, it's what they're doing. I don't do it anymore. I did do it. I don't do it anymore. Because I found that the local pollinators and my rented honeybees were much more effective. So we have... Um, I've done what you said about building local habitats. Right. Um, so we're, we're down to 10 minutes already. So I wanted to um, open up to questions. And I can, I can bring the mic around if... Uh, just raise your hand and I'll come find you. You were talking about the new pest or... Maybe you didn't say new, the one that has the knife. Like, where did that, where did they think that originated, or why is it becoming? <clears throat> we're, a we're a global economy. We're giving pests to Asia, and Asia is giving us pests to us. You know, the emerald ash borer probably came in from uh, China in shipping in the wooden crates because that's where they will overwinter, you know, they'll bore into the wood, wood and then come out, out as an adult. So that's probably how we got the emerald ash borer. That's probably how we got these other insects. And, uh, you know, we can't get mad at Asia because we gave pests right back to Asia, you know? So, uh, and when, when we're moving things instantly across the, the globe, uh, things can be in wooden crates that don't have time to go through their life cycle. And then when they get here, they do. And then they come out as an adult. And the emerald ash borer, for example, is looking for a tree. Uh, the spotted wing drosophila. I can't say it. Drosophila. Thank you. It was native to the Kamchatka uh, Peninsula, and went to Japan, and then Japan to here. But because it it does its it does its cycle so fast, it it just went across the United States in a couple of years. It was clear across. Not like the Japanese beetle that marched 30 or 40 miles every year as it went across. It came into New Jersey, and they can follow the path of how it marched across the country. So I have to wash all my plants that go into California because they think they can keep it out. <laughs> so I'm, I'm washing plants, which is not a fun thing to do. But it's a challenge to manage that pest because uh, of the timing that it lays the eggs. You know, so if I have, uh, you know, depending on the season that the fruits produce, they can be present. So we need to refrigerate things when we, when we grow them in our backyard. Fortunately, it doesn't overwinter here, so we always have the spring crops without it. And, and to tell you how vicious this thing is, you've all seen fruit flies on your banana that got a little rotten or the in came or an apple with a bad spot that got, because those fruit flies can only, they have spongy ovipositors that can only lay the eggs on wet, you know, oozing things. Well, like Bob said, these critters have a little saw or knife on them and they can cut through the skin and lay the eggs. So when you think how fast those fruit flies that you know multiply, now think of something you can just go in and just go up to a green fruit and lay its eggs. You know, they go through their life cycle in seven to 10 days. And they can each lay uh, 200 eggs, all you math people, two to 600 eggs. So all you, all you mathematicians here figure out how much that is over a summer. You know, it's a lot, a lot of flies. It's just some hidden protein in the fruit. <laughs> Bad joke. <Yeah. laughs> uh, Mr. McLaughlin, how long have you been here now? How many years? Um, I think it will be three or four three in or July. Three or four? I was just wondering if you've seen the fruits of your labor, being that Ancel is a two-year program, have you seen students go on to Purdue or go on to another agriculture college? And, and is, it, is it at all, and they're sitting over there, maybe they can answer to it, is it discouraging to them? Because I know a lot of my friends, they wanted to be a local farmer. They wanted to have a four and 500 acre farm. They wanted to watch things grow. And they wanted to make a living at it. And it just wasn't feasible. Mm -hmm. And some of them are with the sprayer companies, and some of them are with the chemical companies, and they've made good livings, right. but they haven't done what they thought they wanted to do. Yeah, um, you, we've had real, real good success um, with, with some students transferring on. Um, uh, Dustin Kirkhove was here. He, he was our first transfer to Purdue, and uh, he earned two degrees with us. And then he finished uh, his uh, first bachelor's at Purdue after his junior year, and his second bachelor's at Purdue after his senior year. And uh, we've got others in different 
pass and, and everything. But um, so yeah, that that's been good. And 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 what's interesting in agriculture is I was at Creighton Brothers a while back, and and they said uh, they need people with things past high school, but they don't necessarily need a bachelor's degree. Um, there are there are a lot of opportunities in our industry for somebody with an associate's degree to do to do well, have a good income. Um, the uh, the situation with, with um, I'm, I'm trying to think of the best way to describe it. Um, there is such a need for people in our industry right now. Uh, w w we have jobs that we can't fill. Um, and so those opportunities are out there. And, and I liked your comment about uh, wanting to be a producer themselves. I don't know. I, it depends on what county you live in. But I think in Marshall County, you're seeing a rebirth of the small farm. Uh, you know, if you live in the country, you have to have five acres to build a house in the country. And so typically somebody will build their house, and next thing you know, they've got a calf or something. They fence it off, you know, and garden and things. So, and I think, I think I, I'm, at least I'm seeing it in my neighborhood. I'm seeing more people that are out there uh, getting their, their hands dirty. Uh, now they obviously still work away from home, but uh, they are practicing different types of agriculture on a very personal level on their own property. I, I've seen the fruits of his labor, just to bring that up. As an industry person in this county, I've seen the fruits of his labor. So to answer your question, it is out there and it is working. And, I'm, and as an I'm, we're glad this program is here. It's, it's incredible. So thank you for the, having this program. Uh, I feel like I'm more of the average kid who doesn't really know much about agriculture and everything. So I have a question more along the lines of the nutrients in food. I was just curious, um, like when I go to Walmart and I buy oranges and milk and all that, is any of the nutrients being taken out of the food? And um, I, I'm, is it still you know, normal, like how it used to be, I guess? Or nowadays, all the techniques that are going on to make so much food, is it taking away the nutrients? We're doing a lot of research looking at the, the importance of having good soil health. You have uh, uh, active organic matter in your soil that helps the plant to take up nutrients and be more healthy. So the quality of the soil that we grow in can benefit the, the plant's nutrient level. You know, it's just like us. We can have hi hidden hunger of nutrients. Uh, so by uh, managing a soil to be a productive soil, I like to see active carbon in the soil because if we're not careful we will allow the organisms to use up the active carbon so having a production system that encourages soil health is important uh, to getting nutrients into the plant which will then get nutrients into the portions of the plant we eat whether it's the fruit the flower the stem the seed uh, to get the nutrients there first the nutrients have to be uptaken from the soil so we need that healthy soil environment the comment was made about Marshall County and more uh, small farms going back. One thing about Marshall County is we have very diverse soil types and we don't have large areas of similar soil types, so we don't really lend very well to massive uh, farming. And I think it will be a, a, a place where we do see a lot of small farms remain because of our topography and our soils. So I think we will see that staying uh, uh, as part of our main culture. The only large thing we could ever scale to, and we're seeing a few things like a hog farm, or the, the food factories, the huge operations, we might see that growing here as an economical, viable thing. Uh, but other than that, I don't think we're gonna see us going to the, you know, the 20,000 acre farms and 30,000 acre farms. Yeah, and, and to the young man's question, um, you know, we see food recalls and all that kind of thing all the time, and I think it makes a lot of people nervous, but uh, I think when you see those things happen, to me, it proves the system works. Now, his particular question was on, on nutrients, and um, I, I think that we're in an industry where uh, some of our packaging and technologies are catching up. Um, when you're dealing with a perishable item, um, you need to figure out a way to package it, transport it, and all that kind of thing. And uh, so I, I would say that, you know, there's been talk about uh, the pla plastic clear cartons for milk and the lights damaging some of the uh, nutrition in that bottle. So um, I think it's, it's good to hear 
a thoughtful question like that from a young person because uh, a lot of uh, the rest of us take that kind of thing for granted. So when we have a population that continues to ask those questions and get involved in that kind of thing, um, I think it speaks good for the industry. Well, that was a very eloquent ending, I think, <laughs> to uh, a wonderful panel, wonderful time here, very, uh, Tim, kind of referencing back to the beginning about information and educating yourself and continuing to ask questions. So uh, let's give our panelists a round of applause. Thank you very much, gentlemen. And we will see you all tomorrow. And I'm going to do the drawing for today's uh, winner. We, I bought uh, five different food theme books out there as well as some local agricultural products. You can get a can of Encilla beef, um, some local uh, maple syrup, or a gift certificate to the Indiana Berry uh, gift catalog. And our winner is Ton. So stick around, Ton. We'll get your picture, and you'll get your food in your book. See you guys tomorrow. <laughs>